Good morning. We did it last week. Let's do it this week again. We're still in the Easter season. He is risen. He is risen. <laughs> you make a heart proud. Yeah. It's good to be with you this morning. I am glad to be here with you, not just because uh, we get to be together and it's good to see numbers, but I'll tell you why, because I know God is doing something here in this church, um, not just the building, but in the ministries here in this community, and uh, I'm glad and encouraged to be a part of it, and I'm glad and encouraged that you are a part of it as well, as God uh, grows each one of us together, leads us on in this journey, and uh, continues to refine us. Don't have a lot of announcements um, as we get started, I do want to point out that Jake Onley, our youth director, has been started now for a couple weeks, doing a wonderful job. One of the things that he's doing is meeting down to the rink on Wednesday nights. They get down there, what is it, about 6 o'clock, I think? Yeah. And um, the folks at the rink, the cobbles, uh, let Jake use one of their party rooms, and they have a, a small devotional time. And I guess they had quite a few kids here the last couple weeks. And so um, if you have youngsters going skating on Wednesdays, um, that'd be a good night to do that and have them stop in and uh, during that time and they'd get to hear a Bible lesson with Jake. Also, I think they're meeting here during the KFC time, like 4 o'clock, and they're having a little bit more of an in-depth uh, Bible teaching opportunity. So that's really good. I'm proud of Jake and the, um, and the ministry there. Also, the flowers on the altar, one of them is for Patty, um, our organ player in the second service, Patty Brown. Her great, is it great, great granddaughter? Great-granddaughter. Ella Rose is her name. So, yeah, they've got a great-granddaughter. All right. Is there any other announcements as we get rolling here? Good morning to those of you worshiping through Armstrong. It's good to be with you. And uh, I think we're ready to go. Let's pray. I invite you to bow with me if you would. <clears throat> Holy God, we serve a risen Savior. His name is Jesus. And he was risen. We celebrated this last week. And Easter is not over. It's not a one day of the year um, event. God, Easter is a celebration of the resurrection um, of Jesus. And the resurrection, the new life, the regeneration, the new birth, the growth that comes in our lives because we've been given a Savior, a Redeemer. God, we celebrate this. We also know, um, well, it is good to get together and celebrate. And we have a we do have a reason to rejoice. God, we also worship you um, through singing, but we worship you through scripture reading. We worship you through, even right now as we pray and we spend these moments recentering our hearts, our minds around who you are. This good work that you have started. Well, we were yet unaware that we needed a savior, God. You chose to give yourself for us. Thank you. May we rejoice here this morning as we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me if you're able and willing. We're going to sing just a little talk with Jesus. I once was lost in sin, but then Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. He beat my heart in love, and he wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our pain is cry. He will answer by and by. And when you feel the Holy Spirit working, you'll know a little fire's burning. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears. My eyes be filled up with tears. But Jesus is a friend both day and night. I go to him in prayer and he knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our maidens cry. He will answer by and by. And when you feel the Holy Spirit working, you'll know the fire's burning. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. 
<laughs> Amen. I don't know if we've ever done this song, um, and, and especially at the early service here. It's a David Crowder song. It's been out for, I don't know, six or eight years. We're going to give it a go here. So. I appreciate being able to see each and every one of you. Traditionally, you know, many have called this in the church calendar, Low Sunday. Why do you think it's called Low Sunday? The energy ends up being a little bit lower after Easter, but, but you know what I noticed? You were here, and, uh, and that blesses me to the core. Woke up saying, Lord, it would be good to be able to see the saints and, and uh, touch base with you again this morning. We, uh, you have been... Uh, uh, filling out the attendance pads. We really appreciate that. I know that that's not an exciting thing to do, but it really helps us in the office. And it also a way for you to leave a, leave a note for us, uh, possibly an address change or a phone number or email that we might be able to write to you, but we are delighted that you're able to be with us this morning. Wonder if, uh, as we just get ready to bring up the offering, we could just bow for prayer. Lord, we have seen repeatedly that you care for your folks around the world. Now we right now have, have much in our society, in our culture, and we know there are those who have very little in other parts of the world right at the moment. Give us sensitivity to them, Lord, for those that are even putting together health kits and, and uh, looking for ways in order to um, just uh, make an impact on people who might be in great need. Uh, we do pray for them. If the cattle uh, on a thousand hill belong to you, Lord, sometimes we need to move the cattle around and uh, give us wisdom as to what our role is all the time. But for these offerings, 
in each generous heart that has given this morning. We ask that you use these for your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want an opportunity just to uh, address uh, particularly any of our children that, that are with us here. I'm not going to make you come up today at all, but I am going to just ask you to just give me attention a little bit here if you can. Uh, I brought one of my favorite things. It would be nice if I could do all kinds of string art. Uh, and I've done this before, by the way, but it seems to be important to use, for me to use it today. So you see, it's just a normal string. I, I don't want anyone to walk off with this because I've got a pair of sneakers at home that only has one string left, okay? So, uh, and also, knowing that it's been on my feet, you might not want this string is all I'm saying. But uh, here we go. Did, did, you know, there's so many things that we're able to do on these here, see if I can't put it this way. But this is one of my favorite ones. I tie up my fingers, move it around my thumb over that pinky, over the index finger, even wrap that through around like this, and I got my, my fingers tied up as well as could. See that, I, it's just tied up like that. And then what I wanna do is see if I can get this off without cutting my fingers in half, and, and I, I did, I, I, I did. That's really one of my, my only string art. How many of you know how to do this at home? <laughs> few of you, few of you do. Um, I feel so good about myself, I'm gonna do it again, all right? Uh, I put that on there, I, I start to weave around my fingers and put it here over that pinky, over that index finger. I also come off of that thing down in there and then I got my fingers tied up, something fierce like that. And the danger is if I ever do this wrong, it might just go right through those fingers, right? And here we go, ready? It didn't! Now, that's kind of a sleight of hand type of a thing. You can find any string art book and it'll show you how to do that. Uh, but, but when you do that in certain places, uh, it, it almost thinks like it defies what you've seen. Uh, I, I know I saw that, but how, how could that possibly happen? Uh, and I wouldn't call that a miracle, only a miracle that I learned how to do it, by the way. But I wouldn't call that a miracle. But what I would say is sometimes when you see things, you're not sure if what you see is real. And today we're going to talk about Thomas who uh, heard from his friends, his other disciples. There were 10 of them left. Remember, Judas was not there that night, but the other 10 were there, and, and, and Thomas was not there. And Jesus all of a sudden appeared. The doors were locked, windows closed, and Jesus appeared. Uh, I love talking about that. I, I can remember being the age of some of you children uh, in, which, uh, in which I would say to the teachers or say to the pastor, how did Jesus get in there? And I still don't know how he did it. Uh, and, and, but the truth of the matter is I've gotten older. That's not the question to ask. The, the question I've learned to, have learned to ask is, what does it mean for all of us that Jesus is alive? He died and now he's alive, back from the grave. What does that mean? And, uh, and so that's the question that we'll keep dealing with today and in the season of Easter. Jerome says it's still Easter, he's right. Um, there, there, um, I think there are six, maybe seven Sundays of Easter before Pentecost. And, uh, and so we'll be highlighting once again what the, what the resurrection means for, for every one of us. But there were lots of people who thought that the disciples had tricked everyone. They thought it was nothing much any different than someone who would take a string and wrap it around his fingers and pretend like he's going to cut his fingers off and then just go like that. That's what they thought was going on with the resurrection of Jesus that someone had stolen the body, someone had hidden it. But as the time has gone on, you and I have witnessed the fact that he is alive. Many, uh, I, you know, I don't know how many, you might not feel that way, but, but I believe that many of us here in this place have sensed his presence as if he was with us right at the very moment. So we're gonna give God thanks that Jesus is alive. And uh, so let's just go to prayer. Thank you, Lord that death could not keep you in the grave. Thank you, Lord, that we know the difference between being tricked and being able to verify with what we see that you are alive. So I'm asking for my youngest friends, Lord, those who are here and those who are tuning in by way of the broadcast, I, I ask that, that, that you help each one of us be able to see and understand 
that you are not only real, but that you are alive today and want to have part of our lives. And we want to turn our hearts over to you. We want to follow you. Bless my young friends, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, this tender moment that we have the privilege to spend with you in prayer. And God, so often it seems like my approach to prayer is to just come right in swinging and asking for what it is that I want. And it's all about me talking. And it seems like in those moments there's very little listening on my end. And so God, just at this very moment, we just take a moment to quiet ourselves, our hearts, our minds. And God, yes, we do have things that bother us, but first of all, we just come to you thankfully, and God, we just come to you receptively as we just wait on you in these few moments here. God, we pray for our friends that are traveling. Maybe uh, still folks that are heading home, heading home from the family gatherings of Easter. God, we thank you that we can be together in these important times of the year. We ask for safety in travels. God, we pray for those who are dealing with bad news. Uh, maybe news that has just been received that, um, God, it's hard to get bad news. And, it's, and it feels in those moments that... Um, Life is over. And so, God, for those dealing with um, bad news or what we call bad news, God, we just ask that um, you would give us the grace to, to be able to trust you through the tough times. God, that we would have the faith to know that when you're involved, um, God, there is always hope. And, God, we also ask for avenues or ways in which um, any of these issues can be resolved. God, we pray for our families, our children. And God, I thank you for the ministries here at this church that um, for generations have, um, the givers of this church have, have invested in our next generation. And God, we are doing that here now. So God, we pray for Jake and for Angel and, and the youth ministry here. And for Amanda, as they work together to reach this generation God, also, as we pray for the leaders, we pray for the youth, God, that this generation would be uh, um, folks that um, are looking for truth, for truth seekers. Um, it is so easy to be swayed or to be caught up in the noise of what people want us to hear or what the enemy wants us to believe is truth, God. But let our young people be a generation of truth seekers, God, and may you reveal yourself to them. And God, as we just am reminded in this story that the pastor just told God, it is easy to doubt, it is easy to um, look at a miracle as maybe something that was fictitious. Um, the, the, just the grand event of the resurrection, God, and it is so um, like me to just hear an account of other people's testimony of your resurrection in their lives, God, and that leaves room for me to doubt, for us to doubt God, and so we, may we experience the resurrection in our own lives. Um, faith isn't something that we set and watch through other people, also some, although sometimes that is encouraging. God, faith is something that, um, that belief is something that um, you give us in our own hearts, that resurrection, the new life, the new start, the rebuilding. Just these words that I find myself constantly repeating, God, the new life that you bring to us. God, we're going to spend a few moments here in your scripture, and we thank you that you have given us a written word, the written message of your son Jesus Christ, the saving power that he has. And we see this in your scripture. God, may you speak to us here this day through your word as, uh, as our pastor leads us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. A 
I did want to just take a moment and look around and, and try to see how many of you, after slipping on the ice last week, have sunburn because you're outside too long yesterday. Yeah, a little bit of that going on. Well, we've been, been working in the Gospel of John last week, and we continue this week. We're going to begin uh, John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. On the evening that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked uh, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Um, after he said this, he, uh, he showed them his hands, his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his, uh, his sins, they are forgiven. Uh, if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, was one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Well, I've titled this particular message, Eyewitness, Eyewitness Talk. Uh, you have uh, probably, like me, uh, and I've lived in several, I think I've lived in three different TV markers, most margin, or, uh, markets in my life. First one growing up was, uh, believe it or not, in downtown Brookville, the only, the only uh, station that we could get for, for TV was Johnstown. It was a... It was a uh, no, it was at Channel 6, I believe, and, and it was an NBC channel. So that was one market. Then, uh, of course, then I've, I've been in the Pittsburgh area a couple times, been in Kentucky, been in the, where, where I've got some of the Erie TV. And, and uh, so I've, I've, I think about four different markets that I can think of. And, uh, and so it's not unusual when I travel as well, and I'm in a motel and I turn on, the, turn on for the news, there, there's often a group called... Uh, Eyewitness news, right? That's a very popular type of a thing, or at least a common title for the news broadcast to take place. And, uh, and so it's as if that word eyewitness is authoritative. But you know, eyewitness is only as good as the one who, who claims they saw what they saw. Uh, eyewitness has, a, you know, every once in a while there's someone who claims to be an eyewitness, and I, I do this with my eyebrows. I go, well, maybe, maybe. Uh, sometimes it's hard to be able to buy what people think is so easy to be able to understand when it comes to being an eyewitness to something that has taken place. So having said that, I, uh, I think of, uh, of Peter in the book of Acts. Peter was talking about the resurrection, and this is Acts 10. He, he was not seen, or he was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. One of the things the disciples had to explain all the time was why they had seen the resurrected Jesus, but not everyone else had. Uh, interesting thought, isn't it? Why did they see it? And they did not. And I think 
Um, of course, these are, I said, Paul, these are really, this is really Peter here in Acts 10. Forgive me. Some of you sharp people figured that out here. Good. It's really Peter who says that, that he was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. Uh, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. It's as if God entrusted this amazingly good news to the very people that he knew would pass it on to someone else. Now, I could shorten this message up and end with this comment right now. If you are, are convinced that Jesus is alive, what are you doing not telling anyone? Okay, that's, that's the end of that message, all right? I'll just cut that one off and now I'll do, do another one, okay? Uh, in other words, God trusts the resurrection to people who will pass that good news on to other people. And that humbles me all the time. You know, you know we, have, uh, we have several individuals, uh, men and women in this congregation, who, who, prob- who have a spiritual gift in evangelism. And I love to be around them. You know, I, 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 I see someone in needs Christ, and I want to say to one of them with the gift, go get them, go, go get them, you know. Uh, share that. Uh, and yet it's never an excuse for me who doesn't have the spiritual gift in that necessarily to keep from sharing the good news that Jesus is alive. Are you with me? Nod your head and I'll move on. It's the only way for the sermon to get done. All right. Good to know. Um, it goes on. And this one is Paul, though. This is 1 Corinthians 15. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living though some have fallen asleep. Um, so now Paul is beginning to say, not only had the disciples been there, but uh, of course he's the one who's written this letter to the Corinthians, but as many as 500 at one time uh, witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. What was their responsibility if you have, have become a witness to the fact that Jesus is alive? Again, it is to share that good news with someone else. And, and then, oh, here's, this is so tough. So that also means that I need to let my life, God takes us just the way we are. I mean, I love that. But then I also have a responsibility as well to live like Jesus as well as I can, or I make a lousy eyewitness for the resurrection of Jesus. For that reason, then, it, it makes a difference as to how I live my life, who I, who I associate with, uh, and... Uh, and what things I say and do. It affects my language. It affects my sarcasm, which I am loaded with sometimes, all right? It affects all those things because I have experienced the resurrected Jesus in my life, and, uh, and so he's evidently trusted me. I, I don't want to get too, uh, too heavy into just, just a theological position, but, but it seems to me from what I've read in the scripture, it just seems this way, that um, that that God reveals himself uniquely to whoever he wants to. That's why you and I, uh, a good way for you and I to be praying for other people is that they just, that, that God somehow helps them to experience him in a, in a way that's unique or some way that gets their attention because God can hold that back if he wants to, but he sometimes gives it as well. You may or may not know that, uh, that this is the month of Ramadan in, in, in Islam. It's the holiest month of the year for them. Uh, that's why you'll hear the fasting that takes place. Uh, the goal of, of Ramadan in Islam is to, is to pursue God in a way like they, they don't even ordinarily, and they focus on it. That's why the fasting during the daylight hours and the eating before it and after dark, uh, that's, when, you know, that's when they eat. If you're a basketball fan that I am, you'll know that Kyrie Irving is fasting during the day, and they're all worried about him that he doesn't have enough strength for his basketball games. And they are losing. I think that's interesting there, huh? Um, all I know is uh, if we usually just set that aside because what's that have to do with the Christian faith? I think the opportunity for prayer here is that if there are a lot of people around the world that are pursuing God in a way they never have, let's ask God to reveal himself to them while they're seeking him. Get what I'm saying? Uh, when, whenever you hear about the... Um, the uh, the Islamic folks having dreams and, and visions about Jesus Christ. I, from what I understand from missionaries who are in those areas, those things really are multiplied during this time of Ramadan. And coming up later on this, this week, I believe the 28th of April, is what they call, um, what, 
it's their most holy night, by the way. Night of power, I believe, is a phrase that they use. Night of power. And, and it's of all their, year, of all their time, and, and even in Ramadan, uh, it's the night in which they, they feel that they the closest in pursuing God and, and him to get back to them. And, and so I'm, I just want to challenge you for the next three or four days to be praying uh, for people around the world, uh, even, in, you know, even here in the States, that, that if they're pursuing God, that, that God would reveal himself through Jesus to them uh, in such a powerful way. And I don't want to miss that opportunity. Why? Because you and I have been blessed to understand the resurrection of Jesus. And sometimes they are going to need to see it much the way Thomas was able to see Jesus in, in being empowered in their lives in some shape or form. Back to the concept of eyewitness testimony. Um, it, it sometimes gets a bad rap because sometimes people stretch, the, um, stretch what they've seen. They, they, they maybe missee some of the things that are happening. I think a couple of years ago, I talked to you about something called the Innocence Project. It's an organization that uses DNA testing in order to review old cases, and particularly those who have been convicted of a crime, and, uh, and they, they apply the new results of DNA in order to help determine um, whether or not this person really could have been, uh, whether or not this person really could have been, have committed the crime or not. And um, a couple of years ago, this stats came from a couple of years ago, because I think I shared this at one time, uh, out of about 239 people, it's called the Innocence Project, 239 convictions, uh, they were able to get overturned. But the ones using the DNA evidence that overturned were 73% of those, or 175. And just by the DNA testing, we were able to find out that they had been wrongfully convicted. And two, th well, no, three, four, 75% of those who had been wrongly co uh, convicted were convicted by eyewitness testimony that was not accurate. That's a really tough thing to be able to, able to deal with. So, so whenever, whenever I run into someone who needs proof themselves that, that maybe the resurrection of Christ is real, uh, and, and I, I know that somehow, unless God um, opens something else up to them, or unless he, he changes their hearts so that they can receive and begin to understand that project, um, it, it might not happen. So the eyewitness testimony stuff remains very, very important. That brings us back to the passage of Scripture today. And I think poor Thomas. You know, uh, Thomas had, uh, well, he just wasn't there that night. I, I laugh. I've been preaching on this passage for, um, for about 44 years. And, uh, and I almost, I probably preach about this on this passage every year. And it's okay. I believe it's one of the ones that we really need to look at uh, repeatedly. It's also why I try not to be repetitive. But I look back on the ways I've preached it over, over these many decades. And, uh, and I used to just, when I was young, you know, when I was young, I blamed everybody else for things except me. I, not that I've completely quit, quit that, but I still do it sometimes. But when I was young, I did. And I thought, Thomas, I... I don't know if I said you dirtbag, but I, I would have been something like that. If you'd have been with your friends like you should have been, you'd have witnessed the resurrection. And if you're like me, you've heard sermons like that, and I, I preached like that, and, and I made it sound like it was all about, if Thomas was just like me, everything would have been okay. You ever, you ever, you ever see that attitude? <laughs> and uh, um, I've really changed that over the years. The scriptures does not say why Thomas wasn't there, and so why do we... Why do we have to, to, uh, to uh, declare why it is that we think that he wasn't there? He, just, he wasn't there. Whatever the reason, he wasn't there. But because he wasn't there, he did miss out the blessing that the others got, okay? Wh whatever that reason might be, and I think that's, that's very clear from the scripture. He missed out on getting to see Jesus in person. But then again, why does, why does God delay sometimes revealing himself to some people, and then the person sitting right beside him or her, God reveals himself. Why is that? I don't have that understanding yet either, but I do know that, that, that part of my prayer life is to continue asking that God would do that. How many of you have got someone in your mind right now that you wish, that, that you wish, I think is the word, or that you'd like to pray that God would reveal uh, himself to that person? Can you think of anyone like that? You know, because they're, they're bound up sometimes with the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. And, uh, 
And, and you know that, that you've been in the right places at the right time. You, you've been around the right people. It may have been in your home. It may be someone who came to you and shared the good news of Jesus with you. You've been able to respond to that. Why can't they respond to that? And the truth of the matter is, it isn't my job to be able to convict someone of sin. It really is. I've tried to do it, by the way. It's not my job. Uh, it's God who does that. And if, and if God does not reveal himself to them, then I still need to be in prayer for that person and to take back my judging constantly of whoever that person is. It just means that God has not shown himself in the way that he had not shown himself to Thomas up to that point in time. But then he does, doesn't he? Thomas is there the following week. And I love the scriptures. This part I always enjoyed. The doors were locked. This is just like a 1960s Star Trek show is all I could say to you, all right? He's in there, the doors are locked, the windows are closed, and all of a sudden Jesus appears. I love that! And yet when I get distracted on that, I miss the joy of that. I, we try so hard to explain the miracles of God that, that, that happen to Sam's, the, you know, instead of just embracing him, my God does things that I never thought were possible. I, I talked to someone just the other day, said, hey, you know, my, my relationship with that person has, has improved. It was like 17 years, and I've, I've been feeling bad for them because they can't ever get any closure on that. Oh, no, that, that's been taken care of, Larry. How about that? In God's timing, he will speak to the ones that he needs to speak to. Your job and my job is to continue announcing the good news of Jesus Christ and to live in such a way that we aren't the reason that they cannot receive Christ. Ooh. You have no idea how many conversations. I have the, the, the fortune of living in several towns in my life. And because I'm, I'm always the new guy in town, uh, I'll sometimes get to hear why someone doesn't respond to, uh, usually it's to a church, not just to God, but usually to a church. It's, it's often because of who we are or how we've treated them or what we're like in our business practices, or what we're like as neighbors. Uh, part of the responsibility I have when I want to talk about my, my eyewitness of what I have seen and what I've experienced in Christ is to recognize that my whole life is part of that testimony, not just what I've seen with my eyes. Well, Thomas is nobody, nobody's fool. He, he finally, he's, he's there. Uh, but, but of course, he did not necessarily believe until he could see the evidence himself. And, uh, and that's why we see in the scripture that these very words that Jesus says. Uh, oh, no, first of all, you know, Thomas, what does, what does he say at that point uh, when, when he just says, uh, my Lord and my God? He, you know, we, we don't even know that he did put his fingers in the side. We don't know that he put his fingers in the nail print. It doesn't say. He just says, my Lord and my God. When you're in the presence of Christ, when he visits you, um, there's an awareness. I, I, can't I can't explain it, and I, I don't think I have to. But those of you who've experienced it know that you've been in the very presence of, of God. And he says, my Lord and my God. Um, seeing and believing. Just a couple of things here before we go. Uh, I don't think that Jesus was uh, scolding him. I, I used to preach that, that, that the, in fact, let me go back to that passage. That was my fault. John, I want to go back to that one there. Jesus says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. H have you noticed in this very congregation, we have people that just have, have faith out the wazoo. I'm not sure what that means, but that's a lot of faith, okay? Uh, they've got it. And then there are others who have logic and practicality just the same way. And they're all, we're all part of the family of God. So we've got some that because mom and dad said that God is alive, they're able to trust that. I think I'm one of them. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those. So that's why you, those of you who are extremely logical I'll just drive you nuts sometime because, because I, at just an early age, I, I just believed in the reality of God. And I feel like he has visited me. His presence has been there so many times that I, 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 I just do. But 
others in our congregation just as precious to God um, need to be able to see exactly how the scriptures were written, which is a good thing. So I've studied that, by the way, how, how accurate the word of God is, how, how it's been transmitted over thousands of years, how there is no other book in the universe that that kind of accuracy and that kind of being passed on from one person to the next. Um, those same ones probably need to know exactly how the earth is created, which things came first, which things did not. That same person needs to be able to see archeological evidence. That's not a weakness, that's a strength because they are the ones that are gonna be the most effective in witnessing to others that are just like that. Um, and the truth of the matter is the congregation is made up of all those. Thomas, for those of you who, need, who, who, really like the, who really need to have evidence and strong understanding of how God did everything that he did, you got to love Thomas because he asked to be able to see the proof and God revealed it to him. And so when that's happened to you, then that's where your boldness takes place as you begin to share with others because there's just as many people out there who need to, to have faith that way as those who just somehow trust and cannot explain why it is that they trust that God is, is real and that Jesus is alive. Seeing and believing. Two things. Uh, for 40 years, I've been talking about Chuck Colson uh, in the Easter season, and I just, I just will again. Um, I want to do that so that I don't forget, all right? Chuck Colson uh, used to say, of course, he was, uh, he was Richard Nixon's um, special counsel and attorney, uh, had a nickname of being the hatchet man. That probably says a lot about him. Uh, and uh, he was the one who was, was kind of an attack dog for, for Nixon. So that whenever the Watergate thing took place, he was special counsel in then his inner circle. And, um, and so he was part of whatever conspiracy that ended up taking place because he was counsel for the whole thing. And uh, he ended up spending seven months in prison in 1974. And he saw what it was like being in there. He saw what he experienced. He met some rough people. He says that the reason that he is absolutely convinced of the resurrection is that uh, of what he understands that the disciples went through. You know, one after another of the, of the, uh, of, of the 11, plus the, the one that they also, you know, that they also uh, joined them here, uh, you know, after the death of Judas, uh, meaning Matthias, one after another of them died a violent death. I mean brutal. Some were hung on a cross. Some of them were, bodies were chopped up by an ax. Some of them were flayed like fish. I kid you not, uh, boiled and flayed, skin removed from their carcass, uh, and just the horrendous ways in which they died uh, for 40 years, because John, and those of you studying Revelation, we believe that John probably was the last one to be, to be living of the disciples. And uh, so for 40 years, not a one of them recanted their belief or their understanding of what they had witnessed that Jesus was alive. Not a one. So Colson goes on to say, there I was with 12 of the most powerful men in the world around Nixon, and we had determined how we were going to go about it and what we were going to say and what we wouldn't say. And he said, I watched in the next, like he, he said, one person decided to, rec to recant on their story, on the lie they were trying to keep. And he said, and everyone went for cover for their, for their own lawyers, their own attorneys. And he said, 12 of the most powerful men in the world, they, they, they caved in in just a matter of weeks. He said, for me, the most attested historical fact I can think of are those disciples that witnessed the resurrection of Jesus and did not recant to the day they died. Believing and seeing. Um, some of you were able to be with us on Thursday. We, we came in here and sat in here and saw the movie on Sabina, uh, the, the, the one from uh, Married to Richard Wormbrandt and, and Tortured for Christ. And these were the Nazi years. By the way, thank you. And if you get to see Joe Johnny, thank him again. You know, Joe's a businessman. He, he, doesn't run around, he doesn't run around with his trade and just giving food away necessarily, but, but he really had a purpose in being able to do that in order to bless people uh, and in order to encourage us in our faith. And uh, so, so lunch was great. But you might have seen in that movie, there were 30 of you here, and some of you here were there. Uh, you might remember the one place where, when Richard, who was an atheist, and had been, uh, you know, had been just not able to 
even believe in God, let alone Jesus, all right? Uh, he, and so as an atheist, he just went through the motions for the sake of his family and parents. He was living the high life. Uh, and then he gets sick with tuberculosis and he goes to a sanitarium where it would be uh, up in the mountains because of TB or tuberculosis. And he was there the better part of, a, I think, at least a year. And while he was there, he had so much time to contemplate and he began to, to consider the possibility of Jesus being real and of the resurrection actually taking place and of God existing. And so he read books, he had all kinds of time himself, and he read it, he's an intellectual. And as he read it, he, he was drawn, I believe he was drawn to the, to the spirit of God by what he was seeing and reading. Looking both at the gospels, looking both at the books that had been written about him, and, and he's really drawn to that. And what it was, was the forgiving of enemies. He just, he just couldn't, couldn't process that as to how an enemy uh, how your enemy could be loved. Of course, that's a theme with he and his wife, as you, as you saw. Till finally, when he's, he's healthy now and he's back home in his hometown, he goes to visit the Lutheran pastor. Uh, and he just tries to talk about his intellectual issues that he had. He had good intellectual. He was an intellectual. It just did not make sense to him. And, and the Lutheran pastor did what I've done many times, I did my best to match intellectual wits with the intellectual. And you know what? We pastors sometimes come up short. And that's what this Lutheran pastor, he said, he says, you're so sm he said, you're so smart. I, 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 can't, uh, I can't talk you into believing. How many of you have experienced that? Someone out there that you cannot talk into believing in Jesus Christ. Have you experienced that? Then if you haven't, then you're not talking to anybody. That's all I can say. Because you'll run into that all the time. So, so uh, Richard is discouraged. He walks away. The pastor then runs out after him and says, Richard, he says, he says, you're more intelligent than I am. I have nothing to be able to explain to you. Why don't you come to the service tonight and see if Christ might appear to you? Fascinating invitation. Why don't you come and see if Christ might appear to you? And so Richard, you know, he didn't promise anything. And finally, in the, in the middle of that service, he Changes, he changes, he starts walking, he walks into the church and sits down. And it really wasn't too much that the pastor said. There's beautiful music that was going on. Um, they, they, you know, they do the song, It Is Well, while he's sit, sitting there. And it's like all his doubt started crumbling away. And without any big explanation from the film, he uh, basically says, I found that I have surrendered my heart to Jesus Christ. When the intellectuals respond, non-intellectuals, you know, we, we've cried tears long before that, but, uh, but when the intellectuals respond to that, it's because somehow Christ has appeared to them in a special way and, um, and what that has meant for the church since that time in, in the 1940s is, uh, is a remarkable thing. Um, what about you? Have you witnessed the presence of Christ in your heart and mind? Have you turned your heart to him? Is he speaking to you even this morning? Those of you within the hearing of my voice, wherever you're at, is he speaking to you? Today's the day of, of action. What does John say in his gospel? Verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I want to invite the worship team to come. Let's pray together, folks. Lord, somewhere within the sound of my voice, you are tugging at the heartstrings of your people. Not from cleverness of preaching, because it doesn't exist, not in this pulpit anyway. Not from great wisdom or intellectual notoriety. But when your presence steps into the room that's been locked and the doors are closed and the windows shut. When your presence comes in like that, 
we become like Thomas and we say, my Lord and my God. For each person here who's experiencing that at this moment, Lord, comfort them that you have visited them. As they open up their heart to you and allow you to, to care for them, forgive their sin, Lord. Empower their witness. Let them step lighter on this beautiful day because they know you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together one more time as we sing their closing song, Glorious Day. One day we in heaven is filled with his praises. One day we in sin. this benediction in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit go in peace friends have a wonderful second Easter amen